Loggerhead Marine Life Center. Loggerhead Marine Life Center is a state-of-the-art sea turtle hospital, research, conservation, and education hub located in the very sunny Juneau Beach, Florida. Our uh, center is free admission. We are based on donations from the public, just like you. If you have something that you think you can donate, we would greatly appreciate if you could click on the donate button below. Even just a few dollars would help us feed our sea turtles right now. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the very exciting topic of water quality. When I refer to water quality, I am talking about the conditions of the water. So if I am a human, good water quality means that the water is um, suitable for drinking or swimming. If I am an aquatic animal, like our sea turtles here, good water quality means is it suitable for me to be living in. So that's really important here at our hospital at Loggerhead Marine Life Center because we wanna make sure that the water is suitable for our sea turtles. We do have them here in tanks. You can think of it as sort of their hospital room while they're here in the hospital. Um, but while they're in those tanks, we need to continuously monitor the water quality. We have a really unique location here in Juneau Beach. We're actually located right across from the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the beach right across the street. And with that, we have what's called an open water system. What that means is that we have pipes that go right out to the Atlantic Ocean and we can actually pull ocean water straight from the Atlantic, where these sea turtles live, right into our filtration system and then into the tanks. The problem with that system is let's say the water quality out in the Atlantic is really poor. Sometimes we have algal blooms down here. You might have heard of the red tide or other harmful algal blooms. What if we have something like a toxic spill out in our ocean? That would actually require us to shut down our water systems. Our sea turtles would be okay for about a week, but then we would be required to work with a partner facility in order to move all of our sea turtles, which we never want that to happen. So our goal here at Loggerhead, we've actually broken ground on our expansion, which we're really excited about. You've probably heard the construction going on next door in some of, some of our videos. We are actually uh, fundraising right now for a new water system to go with our expansion. This new water system will allow us to close off that system if the Atlantic Ocean water quality has become poor and we can still continue to monitor our water and control the conditions here for our sea turtles. So a lot of you that have already donated, thank you for those donations. A lot of that is actually going to go into this new water system, which we're really excited for. Now I'm here talking about water quality and water parameters and you're probably like, I have no idea what a water parameter is. So why don't we go and do that? We're gonna step into my outdoor laboratory for today and I'm actually gonna run through a water test kit with you guys. My lab today is gonna be in our outdoor sea turtle hospital, which I know you're familiar with right now. Welcome to my outdoor lab. I am very honored today because I have the coolest lab assistant, Annie Bo, right next to me. Annie Bo is going to pop in and uh, supervise what I'm doing today and make sure that I hit all of those parameters correctly. Make sure to wave to Annie Bo when you see her. So today, the sample that I'm going to do is straight from the Atlantic Ocean. It's just a water sample that I took down from the beach. And the water kit that I'm gonna use is actually from our partners with Earth Echo International. If you guys have never heard of Earth Echo's water challenge, after this video, please look them up. It is awesome. It's actually an international citizen science project. So people just like you can go out and take water quality parameters once you learn how to do it. And you can submit it to their database so they can monitor water quality all around the world. So I'm going to go through some parameters that we're going to look at today. There's only four basic parameters that we're going to look at. When I say water parameters, I mean different conditions of the water. Some of you might already do this at home. If you have a fish tank at home, you probably already run some water quality tests because you want to make sure that the water is healthy for those fish in order for them to keep living. The first parameter. I know you have heard about this. Comment in if you have heard of temperature before. I hope you all have heard of that. So when I refer to temperature, it means I am checking to see how hot or how cold the water is. For fish um, or other aquatic animals, they really have a certain range of temperatures that 
um, they need in order to survive. So if you think about an aquatic animal here in Florida, sunny Florida, we have pretty warm uh, water temperatures year round. If I were to take an aquatic animal from Florida and drop it into the Arctic Ocean, they probably wouldn't survive very long because that is out of their range of temperatures, which is really important. If you have a fish tank at home, you probably try to regulate the temperature. In my water kit that I'm gonna be using today, again from Earth Echo International, thank you guys for these kits. I have already filled it up with our water sample. And if you look in there, there's actually a little uh, temperature changing uh, thermometer. So it lights up the number of the temperature. It's in Celsius, which most scientists use. Um, and it is lighting up on 32. So it is 32 degrees Celsius, which is uh, pretty normal for our Florida waters. It's pretty warm. The next one up you might have heard of before. It is called turbidity. Turbidity is a fancy word for clarity, how clear the water is. We're very fortunate here in Florida that normally we have pretty clear water at all times, but not in all water bodies. Sometimes um, the turbidity is high. So if you look at this photo here, you can see that this little uh, glass beaker over here is pretty clear. So the water clarity would be pretty high. And over here, the water clarity is pretty low. It's very cloudy. There's a lot of particles that are turned up in that beaker. So what can cause that? Well, a lot of different things. If I were to take a water sample where the waves are crashing down on the beach, the turbidity is gonna be really high. There's gonna be a lot of sand particles that are being stirred up. If I take my water sample somewhere where there's a lot of boat action, that water is gonna be turned up too. If I take a water sample from an area that has a lot of runoff, so there's a lot of chemicals or uh, particles that are running off from the land into the ocean, that water is going to be very murky or very cloudy as well. Now, how do we test that? We actually use a really cool tool. It's called a Secchi disc, and it looks like this. And uh, the disc is actually attached to a rope that has different lines for measurements. So if I were on a boat offshore and I were trying to test for tur turbidity or water clarity, I would actually drop this disc to a certain depth until I could not see the difference in the different colors. I couldn't see the black from the white checkered pattern. And that would be able to tell me how deep the clarity is or how deep I can actually see. Now with our little test kits, if you look at the bottom, there's actually all the way down straight down, there's actually a little secchi disc down there. So can you guys see the black and white checkered pretty well, the difference between them? You probably can, right? Because this is really clear water. The water sample I took is really clear. Again, we're in Florida. We're really lucky that we have some pretty clear water clarity, especially right now. So I actually have uh, a little key code that we can use when we look at turbidity. So if it's really clear, it's gonna be at zero, which means that there's not a lot of particles stirred up in that water. If it's much cloudier, like all the way down here, it means that there's a lot more particles stirred up in that water or uh, the turbidity is really high. So that's the second one. So we tested for temperature, we tested for turbidity. We have two more uh, pretty basic ones that we're gonna be learning about, but you might not have heard them before. The first one is pH. I want you to type in if you have heard of the pH scale before. You might have heard of it, maybe some of you. So the pH scale is basically a colored scale. Um, it runs from zero to 14, and it is looking at um, the, whether the water is acidic or basic. Basically that refers to, to hydrogen ions if we're gonna get technical in chemistry, but an easy way to think of it is, I want you to imagine um, taking a lemon or drinking lemon juice, and I want you all to make the face that you're gonna make when you drink lemon juice. It's really, really acidic. So I want you to associate acidic with lemon juice. Acids like that or acidity, um, they actually have a lower pH, so it'll be up here on the scale. So you can see um, vinegar, we have a lot of citrus juices. Seven is right in the middle, that's neutral. That means that it's not uh, acidic, it's not basic, it's right in the middle. 
if you were to go higher between 7 and 14 that is uh, the water is getting more basic so you thought about the lemon which is acidic I want you to think about if you're ever in the shower and you accidentally get some soap in your mouth that's not a very good taste either, but soap is actually basic. It's on the other side of the scale. So uh, soaps, sometimes if you think of um, ammonia or bleach, other household items, those are really basic as well. They have a really high number on the pH scale. Now for aquatic animals like fish or our sea turtles, that magic number is really between six and eight. Again, I told you seven is neutral, so you don't wanna be swimming in lemon juice and you don't wanna be swimming in shampoo, right? You want right in the middle, you want that seven or between six and eight. So with our test kit, sometimes if you have an aquarium at home, you have different drops that you'll uh, put into your water sample in order to see what the pH is. With this, we're actually, we have a little tablet that we're gonna put into our water sample. I filled this up with the water sample that we had earlier. And I'm gonna shake it and it's gonna do some fun chemistry and turn a different color. Now using our key code here, color key code on our little cheat sheet, I want you all to tell me what the closest number is on our pH scale. So matching up the color on the little scale with the color that the tablet turned the water. So the closest to me is it's about seven, maybe in between a seven and an eight, but that's pretty good, right? I told you that our aquatic organisms really like it between six and eight. So a seven, seven and a half is really great. Lindsay, a lot of our users guessed seven. You did? Awesome. See, it's as simple as that. Anybody can do water quality. It's really, really simple. The last one up is kind of the more uh, technical one. It is called dissolved oxygen, but I'm going to break it down for you. As humans or as sea turtles, as animals that have lungs, we have to breathe air because we are breathing in the oxygen from the air. If I am a fish under the water, I'm breathing with gills. Those gills are actually pulling dissolved oxygen from the water. So a fish still needs oxygen. It's just not in air form. It's in water form or as dissolved oxygen. It's the amount of oxygen that is in the water. So if you are a fish, you want high oxygen, kind of like this little chart shows you. If it's really low oxygen in the water, there's not enough uh, to support life. You really need a lot of oxygen in order to have a really healthy ecosystem. Even in um, our fish tanks that we have in our aquaria inside, we always check for dissolved oxygen. We want to make sure that there's enough oxygen in there for the amount of fish and wildlife that we have in those tanks. Now to test dissolved oxygen with these test kits, it's pretty similar to what I did with pH. I have these little tablets that I'm going to put into our water sample. two of them in. And this one takes a little while. Boop, boop, boop. This one takes a little while to go, but we'll do the same thing. We will match it up with our little test kit. And on our test kit, on our cheat sheet, it'll go into kind of a reddish color. So if it's clear, it means that there's not a lot of oxygen in it. When it gets to a deeper color, it means that there's more oxygen in it, which is better. Now these tablets take a little while, but it's really not changing the color too much, which means that there's not a lot of oxygen in here. My guess is probably because I filled this up uh, a, a little while ago, almost an hour ago as I was prepping my outdoor lab here. So there's probably not too much oxygen left in this little container. But if I were to take this straight out from the ocean and test it immediately, there would definitely be more oxygen in this sample. 
All right guys, so those are the four water quality parameters that we are going to test today. It's really, really simple. And even just something like temperature, you can test at home without any fancy tools. There are a lot more parameters that people test for. So uh, salinity, nitrogen, phosphorus, there's a lot of different water parameters that if we were uh, looking for it, we could test for with different tools. But at home, temperature is really easy and you can actually submit it again to Earth Echo's um, the water challenge online. A couple ways that you guys can help. We've got some ways on here that you can help conserve water. So let me flip it a little <laughs> bit. So the first thing we have is uh, take some action. So you can participate in beach cleanups or waterway cleanups. A big part of water quality is debris items as well. I know we already talked to you about some plastics and microplastics in our oceans, um, but that all ends up, it comes from land and ends up in our oceans as well. So it really does affect the water quality parameters. Think before you pour. A lot of uh, people at home, if you have different chemicals, if you want to get rid of it, you probably just dump it down the sink. All of those pipes actually lead out to our ocean. So always think before you dump it down the drain where it's actually ending up. There are certain ways to recycle or uh, to uh, dispose of those chemicals. Use environmentally friendly household cleaning. Again, everything that goes down that drain is ending up in our ocean. So there's a lot of um, soaps and detergents out there that might use uh, phosphorus. Try not to use those. Try not to use anything that's really strong chemicals that is going to affect the water quality in our oceans. Use native plants. Turn off the tap. Pick up after your pet and walk, bike, or use mass transportation. We're gonna have a lot of these on our website and in our, uh, our lesson plans that you can do after our uh, virtual classroom here. In our lesson plan, I actually have an activity where you can make your own pH indicator at home, which is household items, which is really exciting. There's also a quiz online, so I hope you guys go and check out those lesson plans and those quizzes. With that, I'll take some questions. Lindsay, first question. Everyone would uh, like to be reminded of our beautiful turtle's name. <laughs> if she's gonna come back, this is Annie Bo. Annie Bo is uh, a sub-adult loggerhead that we have here. Wow, right on cue. Hello, Annie Bo. <laughs> Annie Bo has been in some of the, uh, the videos with the virtual coastal classroom, but I'm sure you'll see more of Annie Bo as we continue to go forward. And then Lindsay, a question that we received is, how does high turbidity affect sea turtles in the wild? Okay, so specifically I'm gonna talk about our green sea turtles. So if we have high turbidity, let me pull this up. If we have high turbidity, we have a lot of cloudiness, there's a lot of particles stirred up in that water, it's gonna affect how much light can it actually penetrate into the water. So if it's really cloudy, there's not a lot of light that can come into the water, not a lot of sunlight. So it's gonna affect all of the plants that are growing on the seafloor, especially with our green sea turtles that depend on those sea grasses. If we have high turbidity and the sea grasses aren't growing, it's definitely going to affect our green sea turtles. And especially with all of the other uh, species of sea turtle that you guys have heard about, a lot of their food items, the crabs, the crustaceans, they all depend on that seagrass habitat. Habitat. So if we have high turbidity and we don't have a lot of light that can allow those plants to grow, it is really going to affect our sea turtles as well. And then, um, is there an ideal temperature for the different types of sea turtle species? You know, it really, um, it depends on the species. It depends on Every single species has a different range that they prefer. So again, there are species that travel all around the world, like our leatherbacks. They can really adjust to different temperatures. Some of them even migrate. So if the water temperatures get too low, they'll actually migrate to those warmer temperatures, which different species can do. The smaller species, not uh, the sea turtles, the smaller species of fish that maybe can't migrate as fast, those jumps in water temperatures are really going to affect them much differently. But every single species, every individual species has their own range that they prefer that uh, is really necessary for their survival. 
Um, Lindsay, can you speak to a little bit about how red tide impacts sea turtles? Sure. So uh, red tide is one of those harmful algal blooms. We do see it sometimes down here in Florida. It causes um, a toxin that actually affects the lungs. So our sea turtles, our dolphins, those animals that breathe with lungs, um, it really affects them because when they breathe it in, it causes uh, its neurotoxins. It affects their brain system. Um, so that red tide is actually coming from a lot of uh, nutrients that are washing off of our land. So little things at home, like I talked about, making sure uh, what fertilizers you're using or what pesticides you're using at home, making sure not to dump those down the drain are really important in preventing those uh, harmful algal blooms from happening. And Lindsay, um, last year we had a sea turtle patient named Sage mm -hmm. that experienced um, some issues due to red tide, right? Yes, we definitely did. We had Seish. Uh, Seish was a sub-adult loggerhead sea turtle that we had here that actually came in and was experiencing seizures. So again, that red tide out in the ocean, when um, it is breathed in, those neurotoxins affect the brain. So it was causing Seish's brain to have have seizures basically. Uh, we were able to rehab Seish here in our hospital and uh, release Seish also, which was really exciting. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah. We have a two-part question. Sure. So is coral bleaching caused by the chemicals that are put down drains in households? It's, that's really a hard question to answer. I don't think we have one specific thing that is causing coral bleaching. A lot of coral bleaching actually has to do with temperature changes. Those really warm temperatures um, and uh, sea level temperature rises are actually causing a lot of the coral bleaching. But sometimes toxins, not just from what's going down the drain, sometimes even in your sunscreen when you go swimming after putting sunscreen on, those toxins can affect the corals. But coral bleaching is a really complicated subject that there's a lot of different um, a lot of different components going on that's actually causing coral bleaching. So it's not just from those toxins going down the sink, but there's a lot of other problems that are coming from those toxins going down the sink. So it's definitely a good idea not to do that. And does uh, coral bleaching uh, impact sea turtles at all? Yeah, it definitely does. So I'll talk specifically about our hawksbill sea turtle. Our hawksbill sea turtle that we have here in Florida, we see it quite a bit in our hospital. They eat sea sponges and they depend on those coral reef habitats for those sea sponges. So if a, a coral bleaching event occurs and it causes that coral reef to die off, all of those sea sponges are actually dying off as well. So it's gonna affect the food supply for our hawksbills. And then, Lindsay, can you just tell us a little bit about what's on the bottom of Annie Bo's uh, carapace? Sure, yeah, you're probably seeing it kind of looks like um, maybe some fur growing on uh, Annie Bo's carapace, but it's not fur, it's just algae. Here in Florida, we have a lot of algae out in our oceans. It's um, a really, uh, it's a natural event. It's just a plant that grows in our oceans, but here in our shallow tanks, when we have a lot of sunlight going on, it makes the algae grow much faster than it normally would, but it's not harmful at all to the sea turtles. It just kind of gives them a little coating, but every once in a while, when we do take our sea turtle patients into the hospital, we will scrub that off, but it doesn't harm them in any way. And Lindsay, I just have a few more questions sure. for you. So one main question is, does Earth Echo um, prefer water from inland or ocean? It or? can be wherever it comes from, any sort of natural water body outside. If you go on their website, so if you just look up the Earth Echo Water Challenge, they actually have a global map on their website where you can see all of the entries that people have sent in. It's really incredible. And it really allows us to monitor water on a global scale. We can see water quality parameters all over and when they're changing, when they're staying uh, normal. And then last question, Lindsay. Yeah. Some of our viewers would like to know um, why you became so passionate about saving sea turtles and water quality. Uh, why I became passionate? I have always been passionate about the ocean in general. I'm just a passionate person. I'm sure you can tell that from my personality in these videos. I grew up down here in Florida, right near the ocean, actually not far from Juneau Beach. So I saw that the ocean was really part of our lifestyle. We did everything near the ocean, in the ocean, on the ocean. And if I'm not protecting 
losing it, that ocean isn't going to be healthy forever. I'm not going to be able to have that lifestyle if I don't protect the ocean. I love animals like this, our sea turtles. Um, I really love any aquatic organism I've always been wanting to get in the water. My mom would literally have to pull me out of the ocean in summertime when it was getting dark outside. Um, I've just always been passionate about it and I know how important it is. So that's why I try to communicate that with the public like you. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. We appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning in to our virtual coastal classroom. Again, our free admission center really depends on donations from the public like you. If you have something you can donate, if you want to keep seeing our videos and our sea turtles healthy, please consider donating something. And I hope you tune in tomorrow at 2 p.m. in our virtual coastal classroom.